vowels, these are all made inside your mouth and it's all about what the tongue is doing. So you'll see a box like this and this is usually top teeth, bottom teeth, and then we have our little ridge up here and then we have space for our tongue and then our vocal folds are somewhere down there. So the vowel space just tells you where your tongue is in relation to the sounds that you're making. And we can talk about height. So we can talk about how high your tongue is. It's either gonna be high, mid, or low. We can talk about the depth, whether it's going to be front, central, or back. We can talk about the roundedness of your lips. So what your lips are doing are gonna be important as well, if they're rounded or if they're just spread. And we would call spread lips unrounded. And then also how tense your tongue is. So whether it's lax or tense. And how you can think of it as if your tongue is pushing an extreme boundary, so it's going pretty close to either the bottom, top, front, or back of your mouth, then it's going to be tense. If it's somewhere in the middle, then it'll be lax. So one way to hear this is the difference between the sounds E and I. So in the words beat and bit. They're very close to the same pronunciation, the same place in the mouth, beat and bit. The only difference is with beat, your tongue is tense, and in bit, your tongue is not as tense. In other words, it's a little bit more towards the center than with E, but not that significantly. So we have a few simple vowels in English. We have about nine of them. And then we have combinations of vowels, which are diphthongs. So these ones take a little bit of memorization because some of these are hard to feel in the mouth, but the more you practice and the more you feel them, the easier it becomes. So here are our four English front vowels. And if we were to draw the little diagram on here, I'll just label where these are. So E is high in front. I is also high in front, but it's not tense. So it's very close. E is mid and lax as well. So it's not quite on the extreme boundary here, but it is a little bit closer to the center than something like just a regular E, which would be A. And then we have A, which is low front, unrounded and lax. So you'll notice in English that all of our front vowels are um, unrounded. We do not have any rounded front vowels. So here are the sounds. The high front unrounded tense vowel makes an E sound, like as in beat cleat or retreat. The I high front unrounded lax also is represented with an I in many cases. So bit, rift, or flip ing I, 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 is the sound you're looking for. Epsilon, our mid front unrounded lax vowel is the E sound as in bet or threat or debt. And then A, which is a combination of A and E, you can write it in one fell swoop. I see some people do it like two separate letters, but you can just have fun with the little squiggle there. And this is our low front unrounded lax vowel as in bat, stab, and rafter. Now we have five more that are not front. These are our mid and our back vowels. So, ah is our first one. It's a regular A, but it's important that we write it like this. We do not want to write it with the little hat above because that is a different sound that some English speakers have, but Western Canadian English speakers do not. So in the case of bot, father, watch, this is the ah sound. Now in your dialect, it might also be represented by this vowel. And that's more like an aw, as in bought, father, watch, compared to just bot. So if you can hear the difference between bot, which is the A, and bot, which is that aw sound. Now we have the carrot, which is our mid central unrounded lax vowel. These are in words like butt and fluff and tough. They make the uh sound, uh, uh. We have ooh, this is our high back rounded tense vowel. So as in boot, shoot, or tribute. We'll hear a little glide before the ooh in tribute, but we do hear that ooh sound. We have uh which is our high back rounded lax. So the U and the uh are, sorry, the U and the uh are very similar. One is tense, one is lax. So book, look, and shook. And then we have our schwa. And this is a very special sound. It appears in many places, pretty much whenever we have an unstressed syllable, we hear a schwa. 
and this is the mid-central unrounded reduced vowel. So we don't call this lax or tense, we call it reduced. So in words like Canada, about, toughen, you might be wondering why does an A sound make a schwa, an U, uh, or in about, or toughen, we have an E there. It's because all of these are unstressed syllables. So Canada is stressed, about, the bout is stressed, toughen, tough is stressed. So most vowels and syllables that are not stressed are reduced to schwas. So we don't say Canada, we say Canada, uh, about, tough, un. The vowel is usually pretty short and it's not as enunciated if you try to compare it to other vowel sounds. Now, in terms of the chart where all of these sounds are, if we draw this out, U and U are pretty close in the top right. Uh, we have the schwa, which is dead center, as well as U, uh, which is in the same position, but it's lax rather than reduced. And then we also have our ah sound, which is going to be in the back or lower right side. So back and down. Low back would be the official way of saying. All right. Now we do have one case. This is the schwa. So it's a schwa with a little tick at the end. So you can think of this as a rhotic vowel. So kind of like the R sound, but it's more vowel-like. So, for example, in fur, the sound that we make in fur is er, er. So this is a vowel sound. We're not doing a vowel plus consonant. We're not saying fair, fur, fur. We're just making one sound, fur. So we would use this vowel to describe those er sounds in stressed syllables. Same with world, world. This is just one vowel sound followed by an L and a D, but that vowel uh, has a little bit of R coloring on it. So in unstressed syllables, we'd still use the schwa and R, but in stressed syllables, we want to use the schwa symbol. So if we were to draw a little diagram of where our vowels are in English, we would see this chart. Now, in the official IPA chart, a is a little bit higher than just low, but English speakers tend to pronounce the a a little bit lower, and the uh sound is a little bit more back than how English speakers produce it. So for English speakers, it's probably about in this spot right here, but it's closer to mid-central than it is to mid-back. So that's why we have the descriptions that we have, and that's why the IPA charts might be a little bit different than how we actually describe them. And it's because English speakers still do produce these vowels just in slightly different positions. So here's a quick check. You can try this yourself. We wanna listen to the vowel sound and then pick the symbol that represents it. So with trust, this is a uh, trust, a, uh, a, uh, a. Uh. This is a stressed syllable. So we don't have a schwa here, but we have the caret. We have a uh, trust. In the case of lack, a, uh, a, uh, this is our low front unrounded vowel. So this is gonna be a, ah, the ash symbol. I don't think I gave a name for this earlier, but we call this ash. Now in the case of tempting, we have e, eh, e, eh, tempting. This is our mid front unrounded vowel. This is our epsilon e. Eh. So if you wanna give this a name, it's just epsilon. And then for seat, we have e, e, that's the sound we're making. That is the high front unrounded tense vowel just the lowercase letter i for seat. Okay, now we have five more vowels to talk about, and these are diphthongs, so these are vowels with movement. In other words, they start at a particular location, and then they move slightly as they're being pronounced. So these are vowel sounds like a, i, ow, o, and oi. So o and a are a little bit hard to feel the movement, but if you make sounds like i, ow, Oi, you can feel your tongue move in your mouth as you're pronouncing them. But these are all diphthongs. Uh, just because you can't feel the difference between A and O when you're producing them does not mean they're not diphthongs. You do have some tongue movement there. So here are some examples. Uh, bait, stay, and payment is A. So this is our E sound transferring to E. We do not have E on its own as a vowel in English. So we only ever use this as part of a diphthong. Uh, but Spanish, for example, will have this vowel sound in a word like esqui. 
Now we have ow. So again, we have a different starting sound here. This is ah with a hat, and that's because it starts a little bit more central than our regular ah. So ow compared to ow. Yeah, we don't say ow, we don't say about, we say about. So that ah is starting a little bit more central than our regular ah. So about, trousers, mouse, this is our ow sound. For I, we see that same beginning sound with A. And this is I, bite, style, fly. So we can see it starts at A, uh, and then it moves to the A position as it closes, I. Now, we have O and OI. At this point, if you understand what the last characters are and what the beginning ones are, you can probably reason out what these are supposed to sound like. But for O, we have words like boat, crowbar, showing. This starts at the O position, and then it moves up a little bit to the U. Uh, Crow, boat, show, and finally we have oi. So this one is probably the least frequent of all the diphthongs in English. So boil, exploit, turmoil, um, but you can definitely feel some movement there when you say oi, oi. It starts at the back and then it moves to the front. We don't have any nice descriptions for these. What some linguists will do is they'll describe diphthongs by their first and second positions independently. Um, however, it's usually just common practice to not give these any formal descriptions and just call these diphthongs and people can figure them out based on where they're starting and where they're ending. So let's check these words to see what diphthongs we have. So impolite, steroids, flowers, and disarray. So an impolite, I, I, we start at the ah, uh, and then it transitions to it, so it, impolite. In the case of steroids, well, it's pretty much spelled exactly how it's pronounced in this case. So this is the oi case, starts at the back, goes to the front. Or flowers, this is ow, ow. So we start uh, central low, and then we move i back to get ow. And then for disarray, this is the a sound. We start at the front mid, and then we move up very slightly to a to end it. Disarray, a, a. So the more you practice with these, the better you'll be. I suggest looking at a bunch of different words, listening to the sounds quite carefully, and then trying to give them descriptions. If you need any confirmation on your vowels, you can always type them in the comments, and I can take a look at them and see if you've got it correct. Dictionaries are also another good way to check your pronunciation. Just make sure you're looking at IPA transcription rather than any other type of transcription that dictionaries sometimes use. So this is our final vowel chart for English. Anything with a circle is a tense vowel. And we also have our diphthongs in there based on where they start. So the diphthongs as an A, I, ow, oi, and o are positioned in their initial positions rather than where they end up. But uh, as you can imagine, taking a look at these, we have five, seven, nine, ten, fourteen different vowel sounds. And in English, we only have five letters to represent all of these different vowel sounds. So you can imagine why English can be quite difficult to learn when you're just reading, because it's not necessarily always predictable which vowel sound you should be using based on the letter, because we have 14 different sounds that have to be represented by five different letters. So now that we understand place, manner, and voicing for consonants, as well as our descriptions for vowels, we can now transcribe entire words into the IPA. So, here are six examples with light, light, three sounds, l, i, t, cheese. This is also three sounds. This is our affricate ch, vowel sound e, and then our final sound z. In the case of Jupiter, we have a little bit more. We have j, u, p, i, t. And then because er is unstressed, we would write a schwa plus an r in this case. There will be some linguists and textbooks out there that instead of writing this, they write an R with a little line underneath, and this just means that it is a syllabic R, and this is a phonological change that some people incorporate into their transcriptions. So Jupiter, in other words, it just goes straight to an R sound, and the R is behaving like a vowel in a syllable. Now we have three more words on the right. These have schwas in them. So in the case of derive, derive, 
the stress syllable is rive. So this u uh sound becomes a schwa, it becomes reduced. So in our translation, we get de, uh, r, i, v. In other words, five sounds for derive. In the word massage, we see a very similar thing here. Sage is our stress syllable. So even though we have an a in our word massage, it is still pronounced with the schwa, uh, massage, massage. It's quite quick compared to the ah in massage. So we have m, u, s, a, and j as our five sounds. And now, in the case of salmon, we see that the s, a, and silent l would be the stress syllable salmon. And that would mean that even though we have an o in our writing for the second syllable, it will be reduced. So it's s, a, m, u, m, salmon. And this is also a case where we have a silent letter. So even though we have the L in spelling, we do not pronounce it when we speak this word. So let's see if you can transcribe the following two words, terrifying and attention. It's a little bit difficult, but I'm sure with enough practice, you can do it. So you can pause it, try it yourself. And here are the solutions. So with terrifying, we start with a T and then we get our E terrifying. So E, that's an epsilon. R sound, which is our upside down R, terrifying, terrifying. This could be an I at this point, or it could be a schwa, whether you say terrifying or terrifying. Uh, then we have an F after our Y sound is making our I diphthong, so terrify. And then we have ing, so I and ng, so I and ng. So this is our transcription for terrifying. It might look a little bit weird that you have two vowels back to back starting different syllables. Well, I is the nucleus of one syllable and it is starting the other one. That is okay because again, we're just pronouncing these separately. So terrifying. Now what about attention? Attention. It's not attention, it's attention. So we're starting with a schwa here. Uh, then we get t, e, n. So a ten. And what do we do with chun? A ten chun. A ten chun. This is a ch sound. So a ten ch. And then un, it is going to be unstressed at the end. So we get a schwa and an u uh for attention. So when we think about the stress syllable here, it is ten. Attention. Which, is good, which means that our other vowel sounds are going to be reduced either to a schwa, or in some cases, they might be maintained as an e if. Uh, you are saying it with a little bit more enunciation, although attention is a little weird. Attention. Some people might say attention, where you have that i sound. So sometimes there can be variation between the schwa and the i sound, depending on how fast you're speaking and how much you're enunciating your sounds.